All right, thank you, Torin. That's good. It's my fault because I, I kept saying, is it going, is it going? <laughs> now I know it's going. Um, okay, well, um, first I wanted to give you a result of something I looked up this morning. I don't know why it never occurred to me to look into this, but uh, Torin, could you put up uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8? That's verse I quote all the time. And uh, I consider it a foundational verse, as I've said to you many times. Uh, so much so that when we, when the church, when we started this church, uh, and we're trying to think of a name for it, we borrowed the words from this verse. It says, "For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God." Uh, so we call the church Grace and Faith Fellowship, based on that verse right there. And then uh, later we were down uh, at the sandwich shop one day, and uh, Charlie had a little sign. I remember that. It's hanging back there, actually. He, remember, he uh, gave it to us. And so we got a banner made with that little sign on that says, uh, uh, By Grace Through Faith. And uh, it's an important concept. Uh, and, you know, I've quoted this verse so many times, again and again and again. And uh, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. I remember... Uh, you know, uh, well, I'll, let me just put it this way. Uh, this word saved, we say it in church all the time. And it's, a, it's, it's become a, like a church word. Uh, it's just, it's a religious sounding word. And sometime recently, it just occurred to me, uh, you know, I talk here and then I talk to guys out at the prison who are uh, even, you know, uh, they're not as, uh, don't have as, sometimes as much religious background as we do. M most of us have been in church a lot and exposed to it. Some of them haven't though. And so I'm trying to make things cl clear and plain and try to avoid, you know, ch church words, words we use in church. And so in an attempt to explain, make it easy to understand, I started saying, instead of saying saved, which has, is something we hear in church, use a different word that gets the meaning across. I think sometimes we hear words in church and they, they're church words and we don't ever stop to think about, well, what does that really mean? Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean to be saved? What does saved mean? And I just kind of instinctively started saying, well, it means safe. It means you're in a position of safety. Uh, it means a rescue. It's a rescue word. It never occurred to me until this morning uh, to look it up in the dictionary. You know, that always helps, you know. The dictionary's right there. And back in the office when I came down here this morning to turn on the air conditioning and get things ready, uh, it just occurred to me, the, the thought ran through my mind. You know, you've never looked that up in the dictionary. I thought, well, okay then. Uh, I got one right here in the office. It's Webster's Dictionary. It's, one, it's a standard dictionary. So I just looked it up. And let me tell you what it, what it means. Uh, here's, you know, it's got one, two, three, four, all these different definitions. So the first definition is, of save means uh, to rescue from danger, harm, or loss. That's first one, it's a rescue word. To rescue from danger, harm, or loss. The second is to keep, to keep in a safe condition. To keep in a safe condition. Now, I think that's an important thought, an uh, important way to understand what it means. Uh, number one, we've been rescued from danger, from jeopardy, from harm or loss. And number two, we're kept in a safe condition. Now notice that in this verse, he doesn't say you did it. In fact, he says just the opposite. It's not of yourselves. Isn't that what he said? Not of yourselves. That means you didn't do it. That means you didn't accomplish it. Um, Torn, uh, while we're here, I always like to read the message on this verse. It's really good. Look at what the message says. Saving is all his idea. Rescuing. Being kept in a condition of safety. Is all his idea, and it's all his work. And here's our part. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. Now, I think a verse like that is, is really clear, is really plain, especially when you read it in a translation like the message. We are 
as it relates to God, as Christians, rescued from any jeopardy, spiritually I'm, I'm talking about, uh, and kept in a position of safety. Uh, as I say sometimes, comparing it to a, like a baseball game, when you slide into home base, the ump goes safe. That means you can't be tagged out anymore. And I think it's important to always keep that clear in our minds. Now, sometimes uh, Christians get distracted by uh, worries about, well, you know, what are the limits? I mean, will God ever kick me out? Uh, are there limits to grace? And I'll tell you that uh, only Christians think about that. Non-Christians, it never crosses their mind. And the reason Christians sometimes think of it is because we, because we are in this relationship with God, uh, Christians have a sensitive conscience. Christians have a, uh, a tender conscience, a sensitive conscience. And the devil doesn't play fair. He takes advantage of that and comes at our minds with accusations. That he's called the accuser of the brethren. Did you know that? The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. Any kind of thoughts of fear or anxiety or accusation don't come from God. Uh, they come from the devil. And it's up to us to turn those away. And what's even worse is, uh, see, a verse like this is really clear. But there's other verses in the Bible that are sort of obscure, not as clear, maybe addressing other people. And sometimes thoughts will attack your mind with verses that are confusing or unclear and make people feel uh, afraid or jeopardy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about today about this position of safety we're in. And see, what I think is you need to keep a verse like this in clear focus all the time because that's the foundation for everything else. Here's another one. Uh, Torin, if you would turn to uh, Romans chapter 8, and I want to read verse 1. And here's the first point I want to make uh, about this condition of safety in which we're kept. Remember, it's all God's work. What did we just read? It's his idea and it's all his work. Um, first one is, uh, as Christians, and all we contribute to it, let's keep this in mind. What did that say in the message? I like that. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. That's all we bring to it. We just uh, make a decision to trust, to place our trust, our faith in Christ. And now we're in a position where we're in a position of safety. And the first point I want to make is uh, Christians will never be condemned. There is, this verse says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Now the reason that's important is because even though we're Christians, we are living in a flesh and blood body and we're living in a physical world. And as long as that's the case, um, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but as long as you're in a physical body living in a physical world, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. There are things that can, uh, like Janet was just talking about, there are things, unexpected things that we don't plan for or intend, and, and they're not even necessarily our, you know, to do with anything of us, other people can, you know, we're interacting in a world where lots of things can happen. That's what I want to say. And not only that, as long as you're in a physical body, you've got the capacity to, to fail or to make a mistake or to say something you didn't mean to say or do something you later regret. Christians sometimes are troubled about those things, uh, especially when, when you get in a, a real serious situation uh, where, where your life is in jeopardy. I, I've told this story many times, but it's still fresh in my mind. I remember uh, I got called to pray for a lady who, uh, who didn't come to this church. Her, her children attended a few times, and the doctors had given her a terminal diagnosis, and she was alarmed and asked me if I would come and pray for her. And so when I got there, uh, I didn't know her, so I asked, are you a Christian? And to me, yeah, that's a question that you say yes or no, and I was waiting for yes or no, because if she said yes, that tells me one thing, and that informs me how I'm going to pray. If she says no, then that informs me another way, 
about how to pray. That makes sense, doesn't it? So I said, are you a Christian? But she didn't say yes or no. She said, I've been in church all my life, <laughs> which maybe is commendable, but it doesn't answer the question, does it? I mean, you know, we could all, you, you could be in church and not be, uh, you know, notice that, that Paul didn't say, uh, by being in church, you are saved. <laughs> Did you notice that? He didn't even mention being in church. He said, by grace, that's God's unmerited favor. It's also his independent action. By grace, you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. He didn't mention being in church all your life. But she said, I've been in church all my... And then she added something else while I was trying to figure out how to respond. She said, now listen to this now. And this is the thing, this is the part that troubles me. This is the part that kind of is always kind of ruminating in the back of my mind. Uh, because she said it out loud, but I think other people think it and don't say it out loud. She said, I just hope I've done enough good things so I can make it in. Now see, the doctor told her she's not going to live much longer. So she's now thinking really seriously about that, and she's afraid. That's a, that's a statement of insecurity, and I'm not finding fault with her. I'm just saying uh, that's a real thought that troubles people. And so uh, she said, I hope I've done enough good things so that I can make it in. Well, you notice in that verse we just read, um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul didn't say, First, he didn't say anything about being in church all your life. And then he, didn't, he also didn't say, and now if you've done enough good things, maybe you'll make it in. Who knows? <laughs> Can't be sure. No, he didn't say that. If you notice, this is something I noticed from reading the writings of Paul. He's very positive and he's very confident. And he tries to convey a sense of security, of certainty, of confidence. He's constantly using phrases like, we have this confidence, or we have this assurance. You know, words that are meant to convey a, a kind of security and confidence to us. Um, and so it's not about, about doing enough good things to make it in. In Ephesians chapter 2, it said, by grace you're saved, through faith. Um, so what the point I wanted to make is, if Romans chapter 8 means anything, it says, there is thou, therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. That means he's, you, know, you have to ask yourself, why is, he, why is he telling me this? It's because there is always the potential for you to think, I deserve to be condemned for maybe small things, maybe big things, doesn't matter. But Paul is here telling you, he's trying to inform you, there is no condemnation. And here's the reason why. To them that are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation to them that are in Christ. And that's the plain thought. In means, uh, in Paul's usage, this is one of his favorite phrases. Uh, in Christ Jesus means in connection to or in relationship to or uh, in union with how some people say it. And how did this union take place? Uh, did, you, did you achieve it through all of your strenuous moral striving? No, Paul said, by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It wasn't through what you did. You didn't establish it. Now see, here's the key thought. You didn't establish it, so you, nothing you do can blow it, can destroy it. It's because he established it. It's all his idea and it's all his work. In Christ Jesus means in connection to or in relationship with. He could have said it this way. Because of your relationship with Christ, because you are connected to Christ, because you are in this salvation relationship where you are in a position of safety because of what he did, you cannot be condemned. There's no condemnation. Now, why is that? Because he's already been condemned in your place. That's another thing you find out from reading the Apostle Paul. He's constantly talking about the cross. What happened at the cross? Jesus was condemned in your place. Jesus bore your sins in his own body on the tree. He bore them so you wouldn't. He took the condemnation that you deserved. He took the judgment that we deserved. And because he's already been condemned, you can't be. <laughs> That's a good thought, isn't it? As I was reading about this, uh, 
oh, the day before yesterday or whenever it was, I found a statement uh, that I kind of liked. He said, uh, you can't hang a guilty man twice. <laughs> He's already been hung on the cross. So it's already done. Now, I, I need to deal with, uh, in passing, the rest of this verse in the King James translation. You see... Uh, We've been at this a long time now. It doesn't, doesn't seem like, it seems like only yesterday, you know, when we started the church, but it was back in the 90s sometime. April, do you remember when it was? Yes, I do. See, she, she knows all the dates. 98, was it? Yeah. And so uh, I've been talking about subjects like this for a long time, and it always amazes me that some people, some Christians, it makes them mad, you know. I guess it rubs their religious assumptions the wrong way. And I remember this one particular man um, he was really upset about it. And, you know, any time I'd be criticized by some people like this, I would just have to say, well, here's why I'm saying this. Here's why I, I'm preaching this. Look at this Bible verse right here, you know. It's not me. I'm just reading out of the book, you know. So I quoted this to a man, uh, this verse. And he says, yes, but the rest of the verse says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So what does that mean? Well, he said, well, that means we can't do anything wrong. Well, for one thing, that's not exactly what he said. It's open to interpretation, number one. And number two, if you are a studious person, if you are an open-minded person, if you trust Bible scholars, and I'm going to, I hope this isn't shocking to you, but those words, the second clause of this verse, don't belong there. They are transposed from verse 4. That's where they're, they're, in, they're repeated again in verse 4. So the first thing is, why would Paul say, it, say the same thing twice? Uh, it's, he doesn't, he's not, the whole thrust of what he's saying is not to add a qualification what it, the thrust of what he's saying, and I, and I base this on the context. In the previous chapter, he talked about the fact that, you know, in chapter 7 of Romans, if you've ever read Romans, there's this verse that says, uh, I find that, that th because of my flesh, the things I want to do, I don't do. And those things I don't want to do, those are what I do. And then he, at the end of chapter 7, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? And then he says the answer, I thank God it's through Jesus Christ. Then the very next verse says, in verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Now, if you leave out those next words and just read verse 2, Torin, give me verse 2, it goes right on there. Here's why. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death which fits perfectly with what he had said in chapter 7. Verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4 says, That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now where those words appear in verse 4, now you, they appear in a different light. He's saying, uh, We walk in accordance with what he's done for us spiritually. And we're not even looking at the flesh, because in chapter 7 he said, in my flesh sin dwells, and if I walk in the flesh, I do things I don't want to do. So that's the intent of what he's saying. Um, let me tell you what happened, if, if you don't mind me saying so. Uh, back in verse 1 where it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those words, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, do not uh, appear in the best Greek manuscripts, or the ones that have come to light since the King James translation was written. Number two, no, no early church fathers ever quoted those words. Uh, number three, here's where they came from. The Latin Vulgate Bible, which was translated by a man named Jerome for the Roman Catholic Church, which was riddled with um, questionable things uh, and uh, many things, and I don't want to get into all the different things that Martin Luther was, you know, he was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. And he pointed out a lot of flaws with Jerome's. That was in the third century when that was made. That's where these words first appear. 
in Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Now, when the King James translators came along in 1611, uh, James I was the King of England, and he wanted a very conservative translation. He didn't want anything radical. And they were very cautious uh, about how they translated, and they didn't want anything. They tried to play it safe, in other words. And there's many things in the King James translation that reflect that, like when you read in the Gospels about the word baptize. Did you know baptize is not an English word? Baptize is a Greek word that was transliterated into the English language. Here is why. Because they didn't want to translate it, because it would make King James angry. If they had translated the word baptize, what it actually literally means is immerse. But in the Church of England, which King James was responsible for, they practiced sprinkling on the head, you know, like in a lot of denominations do today. And so they were, were careful about a lot of things. They didn't want to offend. So they played it safe here, and they used Jerome's Vulgate for these words. Um, this is a book I have by a man named Kenneth Wiest, and he's a Bible scholar for the Moody, or he was when he was alive, for the Moody Bible Institute. And it's a very... Uh, kind of in-depth, kind of scholarly book, and I rely on it a lot. And uh, I looked this up in Wiest, and let me just read to you what he says about it, because um, I think it's enlightening, and I also think it's very positive. Um, Wiest says, uh, the words who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit are rejected by, and then he quotes scholars that he feels are authorities, by Nestle, Westcott, and Hort. And then he tells us why it's important. Paul does not base his assertion that there is no condemnation to saints upon the saints' conduct, but upon their position in Christ. In other words, it is what God has made the believing sinner that ensures the fact that there is no condemnation for him. I think that's really good, don't you? It's, it's what God has made us, not what we do. And so uh, those words, you could just, uh, you don't need to consider those, put them where they belong, down in verse 4. And, uh, and so the thought that you need to get it, and here's another thing, all modern translations have just the first statement. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Then they go into the next verse. Let me read you a few. I looked a few up for you, and here's what they say. These are all really good. Um, this is the contemporary English version. If you belong to Christ, you will never be punished. How about that? I like that. So those who are believers in Christ can no longer be condemned. That's from a translation called the God's Word translation. Philip says, no condemnation now hangs over the head of those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, the New International Reader's Version says this, those who belong to Christ are no longer under God's judgment. Uh, that's a good thought, isn't it? And then finally, uh, I'm going to base what I'm saying here on Apostle Paul himself. If you go in reading in Romans, see, here's, here's a little Bible interpretation tool. If you come to something and you have a question about it, just go on reading. <laughs> if you go on reading and read what came before and read what comes after, it'll all become clear. If you go on reading in chapter 8, and Torin, if you'd skip over to how he concludes chapter 8, look at what he says here as he's summing up verse 34. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Uh, here's how he's summing up. Look at these. And he's asking a series of rhetorical questions to get you to think. He wants to really drive this point home. And he, um, 34. Yes, yeah, same chapter, verse 34. Who, who is he that condemneth? Paul's asking rhetorically. In other words, who is going to condemn you? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. In other words, he's saying, why would you ever think you're condemned? This goes back to what we read in verse 1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He said, do you think Christ is going to condemn you? No, he died for you. Why would he condemn you? He died for you. And not only that, not only did he die for you and take your sins away at the cross, now he's alive again and he's at the right hand of God on your side making intercession for you. Paul's appealing to your logic here. And then again, we should ask ourselves, I, I do this all the time when I'm reading the Bible, why is he telling me this? You know, what's this in here for? Did he just need a few extra words to stitch it all together? Now, this chapter's not long enough. I'll put a few extra words in here. No, he, he put all this in here 
Because it's important. Why is it important? Why, is it, why, is it, why does he want you to sink this into your consciousness? Because he wants you to feel secure and stable. That you're standing on a, a secure foundation that can never be shaken. Not by anybody else, certainly. And not by yourself either. Christians are troubled sometimes because of regret, because I said something once I shouldn't have said. I did something once I shouldn't have done. What you need to know is anything that you have ever said, anything that you have ever done uh, that, could, that could ever condemn you, he knew it before you ever did it, and he put it on Christ at the cross, and he took it away and paid for it, and it's gone. That's why Paul says, I'm going to say it this way, there cannot be any condemnation. There's no condemnation for anyone who is in this relationship with Christ. Um, here's point number two. Uh, your act it wasn't your actions that made God love you. It was, he started it first. It's not your actions that made God love you, and your actions won't change his attitude. Look at, we're in here in Romans. Here's a good one. I like this chapter. I always look at any excuse or opportunity to read it. This is in Romans chapter 5, and I want to start with verse 6. Torrin, it's Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength, uh, the Amplified says helpless. When we were uh, incapable of doing anything about it, without strength, helpless, in due time or uh, at the appropriate time, at the time appointed, in other words, Christ died for everybody in church. No. For, well, okay, that's... Oh, yeah, torn uh, verse 6 is what I want first. For... When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. Not the godly. The ungodly. Uh, anything you could ever conceive of that is a characteristic of ungodly. Uh, it says he died uh, for that. He didn't get mad. He didn't uh, say, uh, uh, that's it for you, bub. <laughs> in, when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. That's saying we, would, we can conceive of risking our lives for someone innocent or someone, uh, you know, like in your own family or something, you know, you could conceive of risking your life for someone that you love or care about, right? And a person, you know, an innocent child, for instance, you could conceive of, maybe rushing into a burning building to rescue an innocent child or maybe a cat. <laughs> well, some of them are not so innocent. <laughs> Elizabeth brought home this kitten from the vet the other day. I'll tell you what. Well, let's just say it's got a lot of energy. <laughs> anyway, but you could conceive of rushing into jeopardy to save someone uh, that's innocent. But here he says, you know, we, that we can, you know, that computes with us. But then he says, but God, verse 8, this is the verse we had a minute ago. But God commends, or it means introduces us. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, you could conceive of, you, do you know why he's saying that? He's saying, don't think that it's because you're such a holy saint that God loves you. Don't think it's that his love for you is based on your performance. And that if you fail in some way, then it's going to diminish or counteract his love for you. He says, no. He says, God introduces us to his kind of love in the, while we were at our worst, uh, while in, when our performance was at its worst, when we didn't care about God, when we weren't thinking about God. When... You know, think of it this way, God knowing everything, all of our flaws and faults and everything we're capable of, loved us. So it wasn't based on your performance. It was never based on your performance. The, so in verse 9 he says, much more then. Uh, not much less, but much more. 
much more. You know, I, I've talked to people, you know, you would, you'd be surprised what kind of weird logic people come up with. Uh, and people have actually said these things to me. Well, see, God will, God will, you know, he's got grace for sinners. He'll, you know, he'll forgive people to get them in. But once you're in, he's, man, you better not mess it. M miss it. You better not fail. Once you're in, he's really, in other words, he's really strict on the Christians, but sinners, yeah, well, you know, he'll give them grace, but not for the Christian. See, not only does that not make any logical sense, in other words, he's nice to the sinners, but he's mean to the Christians. Not only does that not make logical sense, it contradicts what Paul's writing here. That's why this person I'm talking about, and by the way, he got so mad talking to me. What made him mad was I kept quoting these verses. And I thought, I thought, you know, at one point, I thought he was getting so mad he was going to punch me right there in the fellowship hall. <laughs> of the church. The fellowship hall. <laughs> yeah. I know. And I kept quoting verses like this that contradicted what he was trying to argue. And he said, well, that's just Paul's opinion. <laughs> well, look, you know, it's not just his opinion. He tells us, when he wrote to the Galatians, he said, don't think for a minute that what I'm saying to you uh, came from men. I didn't learn this from Peter, James, or John. And he could have actually, if he had, if he had known somebody down here in the future, 2,000 years in the future would have said that. He said, and it's not my opinion either. He said, what I'm conveying to you, I got it directly from Christ himself who gave it to me. And by the way, to give to us. I think Jesus chose Paul because he knew he was a, he was a wordy person. And he, would, and he liked to hear himself talk, I think. And he knew he was going to get all this stuff written down and then sending it to all the churches. Just think about what kind of energy it took for him to get all these letters written. I mean, it wasn't easy to write a letter back in those days, you know. And uh, so anyway, I think Jesus chose him for that reason. Because, you know, this guy, he's, he's a talker. And he's going to convey all this down through the ages. It'll be written down and everybody 2,000 years in the future. They'll be sitting in Alva, Oklahoma at Grace and Faith Fellowship. They need to know this. <laughs> Much more than, not much less, but much more than being now justified by his blood. Justified means made right. By, by your perfect performance. No, by his blood. Much more than we shall be saved. Think about what the word saved me. Don't, forget the church, you know, the fact that we say that in church. Uh, what did the dictionary say? I'm going to quote that again. Safe means, save means to rescue from danger, harm, or loss, to keep in a safe condition. Uh, much more than now being justified by his blood, we are kept in a safe condition from his wrath. Wrath is a word that Paul uses to describe the judgment of God, the just judgment of God. Um, verse 10, he explains a little bit more. For if when, listen, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled. Before we go on reading, get that. When we were enemies, we were reconciled. Well, then that ought to tell you right away it wasn't you that reconciled yourself, it, that you didn't have anything to do with it, because at the time, you were enemies. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. How? By the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be kept in a condition of safety by his life. Does that make sense? Is that clear? I think that's pretty clear. I like, I like saying that. I like saying kept safe. Kept in, I like this. You know, dictionary is pretty good preacher sometimes uh, if you look up the right things. Um, let me read just a couple more. I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, this is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. So then the objection sometimes arises. Well, okay, that's all true before I became a Christian. Before I... You know, it's, it's almost kind of sad in a way. People will say, well, before I got saved. Well, think of it, you know, it's because we use it in church and we, that's just our church lingo, before I got saved. Well, if you think about what that means, then this question wouldn't arise. Saved means brought into a condition of safety, kept in a condition of safety. It's not like something that, see, I think what people think in their minds is, well, he'll give you a second chance. No, there's no chance to it. It's not a second chance or third chance, you need, more, you need more than a chance. It's certain. 
uh, he brought us into a condition of safety. So what troubles Christians sometimes is, well, since I've become a Christian, I've made mistakes. I've failed. Well, you know what? Join the club. Uh, I've never met a Christian yet who hadn't. Got quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> no. No, any Christian you want to name, whether it's Billy Graham or Mother Teresa, I guarantee you if you sat down with them, somebody you admire and think of as a saint, I guarantee if you sat down with them personally and talked to them, they would, they would readily confess to you, it's, I'm not perfect, I've made mistakes. We all have, everybody has, and he knew it ahead of time. He knows what we are, he knows what we're made of. That's why our salvation, our safety, where God is concerned, isn't based on, how many different ways can Paul say it? Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Uh, when we were enemies, we were reconciled. He says it every way you can think of, that it wasn't you. We didn't establish it. He did it. And he knew ahead of time everything wrong that could ever happen. And he put all that on Jesus. Now, this is in 1 John chapter 2. And here I like this because he specifically addresses uh, Christians who make mistakes or who fail. Uh, verse chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children. That's how you know he's writing to Christians, first of all. He says, uh, These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. I like what the uh, Phillips translation says there. It says, I'm writing these things to help you avoid sin. Uh, let, let me, uh, well here, let me do King James, then I'll do Phillips. Uh, I write these things to you that you sin not. Well, you know, if that be the end of the verse, that's what... Churches love to preach that, you know. Pastors love that. That is, that message has gotten across to us. But he's not done yet. See, because the unspoken question that arises is, yes, but what if, what if I fail? So John, being a very sensitive uh, person evidently, addresses that. I write these things to you that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate. Remember, that's what Paul said. He's at the right hand of God making intercession for us. So, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. You notice why he's called the righteous, because it's singular. He's the only righteous one. We, as Christians, are only righteous because we are covered with his. Uh, now, notice what he says in verse 2. This is really good. And he, that's Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. Who's our? That means, well, our means the writer and those to whom he's writing. That means John himself and the Christians to whom he's writing. Our means the sins of we Christians. Because, and it's clear because of what he says next, he's the propitiation for our sins, our, as Christians, sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That's how we know our means Christians. He says he is the sacrifice. That's what a propitiation means. Um, let me read you what the Phillips translation says. I, I like this. Uh, Phillips is good. I, I like some of the ways he says things. I write these things to you to help you avoid sin, but if a man should sin, remember that our advocate before the Father is Jesus Christ the righteous, the one who made personal atonement for our sins and for those of the rest of the world as well. Um, Here's a Bible translation I found called the Expanded Bible. If you think the Amplified translation is wordy, wait till you hear this. Uh, this is called the Expanded Bible, so that gives you a clue. Uh, he died in our place to take away our sins. His death pays the penalty and removes God's anger from us. And not only our sins, but for the sins of all the people of the whole world. That's pretty good, isn't it? The Living Bible is always uh, good. Uh, the Living Bible says... He is the one who took God's wrath against our sins upon himself and brought us into fellowship with God. And he is the forgiveness for our sins, not only for ours, but for the whole world. Now, uh, just one more topic and then I'm done. What comes up sometimes in talking about this, and I'm trying to make it as positive as possible, you know, because I think we need it. I think we need that as a foundation. We need to know clearly and plainly that we stand on solid ground. It's not ground that we established, but he established. It's not based on our performance, based on his performance. It's not about us, it's about him. And I think all these verses that we've been reading here have, have pointed that out. Sometimes, though, people will 
You know, and the reason people bring up these objections is because it troubles them, because they're worried in their back of their minds. And I'm kind of actually thankful for people that actually vocalize it, because I think most people are afraid, but they won't say anything. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you something uh, uh, that happened to me recently. Um, uh, I was out at uh, Bill Johnson's talking, and, you know, I say the same things to them I say to you, because as far as I'm concerned, we're all in the same boat, we're all the same, you know. So I, I give them the same kinds of messages. Uh, but sometimes, you know, they're not shy about raising their hand or just blurting something out, you know. And so we were talking, this is actually last Sunday night, and a man just blurted out, well, what about the unpardonable sin? Then he said, isn't blasphemy the unpardonable sin? Now, this guy that said that, I, I could just sense by what he said and also just you know I just kind of had a sense he's not some Bible scholar who's just studying the Bible closely he didn't get that from his own Bible study he heard somebody say that that kind of got through to him well what about blasphemy isn't blasphemy the unpardonable sin and happily I was able to say to him no 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 a thousand times no let me say to you what I said to him and for those who are watching on our YouTube channel there is no unpardonable sin for you as a Christian. And blasphemy is not an unpardonable sin. Um, let me tell you where that comes from, and I want to point something out to you. And the only reason I'm doing this is so that you see uh, what that's talking about. See, people get these ideas that are not really biblical. Uh, this is in Mark chapter 3. I'm going to read the, all three of the uh, synoptic gospels have this story. But I'm going to read Mark's version, and I'm going to start with verse 22. Mark chapter 3, verse 22. And Though this thought never may have never crossed your mind, file it away for somebody who uh, brings it up. A lot of people are afraid of this. A lot of people think they've committed some kind of unpardonable sin. Um, so here's what happened. This is verse 22. Mark chapter 3, verse 22. And now again, this story appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all have this story, and they all have different details. But I'm going to read it from Mark's gospel. Verse, 30, verse 22 said... The scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. That's Jesus. They said this of Jesus. He hath Beelzebub, uh, and by the prince of the devils he casteth out devils. Now what happened here, if you read it in the other Gospels, I'll tell you the background. Uh, they brought to him a child who was possessed of a spirit and was deaf and dumb. And so Jesus, of course, helped the child. And he healed the child and he cast out the spirit. But the Pharisees were standing there, and I guess I'm attributing their motive to jealousy, or I suppose. So they, they looked at what had happened. Instead of saying, oh, wonderful, this child has been helped. Instead of having compassion on the fact that the child has been helped, they were jealous of Jesus. And so they said, well, the only reason he can do that is because he does it by the power of Beelzebub, <laughs> the prince of the devils. Now... That's, that, well, that's a pretty harsh thing to say. Stupid, too, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, look at what, first of all, Jesus addresses this, the stupid logic of this. Verse 23 says, He called them unto him, and he said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? Well, that's a good point, isn't it? In other words, you're saying it's power of the devil to cast out the devil. Now, how's that? You know, why would the devil cast out the devil? See? Then he says, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand and hath an end. Verse 27 says, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. You know what that means? That means... The devil's like a strong man, and he's kept people in bondage, but I'm stronger than he is, and I've come along and bound him. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I'm stronger, I'm bigger than the devil. I'm not Beelzebub, but I'm bigger than that devil. That's what he's saying. I bound that strong man, that's why I can come here and set people free. But look at this. Here's where the idea comes from. But I want you to see the context first. It's because they stood there and watched him heal a child, and instead of being glad for the child, they said, well, that... Jesus, he's doing it by the power of Beelzebub. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, and again, he's, remember the context, 
Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. Now before going on, you should hang on to that. All sins. You know what all means? What's all mean? Everyone without exception. Is that right? Think about it. Everyone without exception. He said, all sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith they shall blaspheme. Now here's where the idea of an unpardonable sin comes from. Verse 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. What's he talking about? He's talking about those Pharisees who looked at him and saw him cast out the devil from a child and said, well, that's just Beelzebub at work. So in reference to that, he said this about them. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. Uh, and that's just really a way of saying, if you're going to condemn the one who's bringing to you forgiveness, how can you... In other words, if I offer you a $5 bill and you push it away, then you can't receive it. That's basically what he's saying. Now, here's the clincher of it. This verse here that gives people the idea of an unpardonable sin, look what follows in verse 30. Next verse. The very first word of uh, verse 30. Because. You know what because means? It means this is why. This is why he said it. When he said, whoever shall blaspheme the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Now the whole thing about this so-called unpardonable sin is because they said, because they said, has nothing to do with you. And here's the thing. If anybody wants to think they've committed an unpardonable sin, let me tell you what you've got to do. First, you've got to see Jesus cast the devil out of somebody. That disqualifies most of us. First, you've got to, you got to look directly at Jesus and watch him cast the devil out of somebody and then say to him, and everybody else said, well, he cast out devils by the prince of the devils, by Beelzebub. Now, if you, can, if you can do that, then I might entertain the notion that you've committed what he said here. But see, the point is, if you actually read it, there's nobody alive. He was talking about those Pharisees there that were going around, or saying, right, not going around, but just saying it directly. He cast out devils by the prince of the devils. It's, it's limited to them. Uh, there's nobody alive, let me tell you plainly, there is nobody alive who has committed an unpardonable sin. Jesus said all sins will be forgiven, all blasphemies, all sins. And speaking of blasphemies, let me just read you one more. One more. Sorry, I know this is kind of long. Math Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. Matthew chapter 26. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. But I want you to get this. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. You might need to remember things like this to help somebody sometime. This is, uh, let's see, am I in the right chapter? Oh, yeah, I'm in the, yeah, this is a long chapter. Uh, this is after Jesus was arrested. And so they've taken him away. The Romans have put him in chains and hauled him away. And it said, verse 69, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Are we in the right? Oh, 26, 69. Not 16, 69. Yeah, thanks, Torn. Yeah, I want everybody to be able to see this. Yeah, it says, Now Peter sat without in, in the palace, and a damsel came to him, saying, Thou wast with Jesus of Galilee. Verse 70 said, But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. So here in verse 70, he's denied Christ publicly. Verse 71, And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 72 says, And again he denied, this time with an oath. He swore. He denied with an oath. See, Peter is now the second time publicly denied Christ. This time with an oath, saying, I know not the man. Verse 73, he's not done yet. After a, while came unto, uh, after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou 
also are at one of them. For thy speech, speech berayeth thee. That's King James. That means betrayeth thee. In other words, your speech tells on you. Now listen to what it says in verse 74. Remember what Jesus said, all, what did he say? All sins and blasphemies wherewith men shall blaspheme shall be forgiven. Verse 74, oh no, not Peter. Yes, Peter. <laughs> says, he began to curse and swear. Now we don't have the actual words here. Well, thank goodness, you know, I mean, give him a little dignity at least. Uh, he began to curse and swear. See, I don't know how they cursed and swore back in Bible times. But it was enough that Matthew uh, made mention of it. Don't you think, at this point, don't you think, well, let's go and read. Then began he to curse and swear, saying, I know not the man. So now he's denied him three times with an oath and with cursing and swearing. Man, that's, I mean, I'll tell you what, he's pushed to the limit, hadn't he? And immediately the cock crew. Now Jesus had told him back earlier when Peter said, even if everyone denies you, I'll never deny you. Jesus said, before the cock crows, uh, you'll deny me three times. Uh, and here it happened. Verse 75, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, do you suppose, at this point, do you suppose Peter feels bad about this? Yeah, I think anybody would. But here's the good news. No matter what you do, no matter how big a... Man, talk about a belly flop, you know. Talk about a, talk about a failure. This is like, you know, this is like big time failure, I'd say. But did this exclude Peter? Did this damn him for all eternity? No, he goes on and he's one of the leaders of the church in, in Acts. Uh, this didn't disqualify him. Because Jesus said all sins and blasphemies will be forgiven to the sons of men. Uh, there isn't anything that disqualifies you. Let me end on a positive note. And here's, here's like the bottom line of it. This is in John chapter 6 and verse 37. And this is the last thing I'm going to say, I promise. John chapter 6, verse 37. Unless I think of something else. No, I'm done. No, I really am. I'm just joking. John chapter 6, verse 37. Look at what Jesus said here. See, this is, this is the foundational truth behind it all. All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me, or come to me. And him that cometh to me, who's that? That's a Christian. That's you. That's me. That's Peter. Uh, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now that's King James. I don't say that. I don't go around saying in no wise. Is that how you talk? No. But what we would say is under no circumstance. There is no circumstance under which I will cast him out. Did you know that applies to all Christians? Under no circumstance will he reject. Jesus never rejects any Christian, no matter what you've done, no matter what anybody's done. And the very fact that you're troubled about it should prove to you that that's the case. In no wise uh, will I cast him out. That means under no circumstance. There is no circumstance. Now, that's pretty good. I think King James is all right, but the message is even better. Look at what the message says. Every person the Father gives me eventually comes running to me. And once that person is with me, I hold on and I don't let go. Isn't that a good thought? I hold on and I don't let go. Now, we may, Peter did, Peter let go. Isn't that right? Isn't that how we could characterize that? What we just read, Peter let go. Whether through fear or confusion or for whatever reason, uh, he let, man, he let it all go, didn't he? <laughs> but Jesus didn't let go, right? Same goes for you. Same goes for anybody in your family. You need to Think about this. Our relationship with God does not and never rested on what we did or would do or have done. It has always rested on Him and what He does and what He can do. And let me tell you something. He's much bigger than you are. And He's much more powerful than you are. And what He establishes 
Nothing we do can undo it. Okay, I think that's all we got today. Let's all stand up.